All right, in this video, let's talk about WebSockets, C++, and the rant on JSON. So I came across something which you would find interesting. This is a library, Micro WebSocket, which we also use at CodeDAM. It's a very amazing piece of software, which lets you write very performant, very efficient WebSockets in Node.js, BUN, all of these runtimes. In fact, BUN actually uses Micro WebSockets as their default runtime. It's also listed on BUN's homepage. So if you go to BUN's homepage, the WebSocket benchmark you see, this is actually micro WebSocket. I mean, BUN obviously did have APIs to communicate with micro WebSocket, but this is what it is using internally. And that's why it beats WS package, which is again, a very popular WebSocket library by so much, right? So this is mostly a combination of BUN and micro WebSocket both, but a lot of this height over here is because of micro WebSockets, not because of BUN directly. So anyway, long story short, this is a library which actually is written in C++. So if you go to its actual main repo, you're gonna see the micro WebSocket.js page. This page over here, this is a C++ repo, right? But this page over here, it's nothing but just a wrapper which invokes that C++ binary for all the actions and everything. So the source code of micro WebSocket JS is not in JS, right? It's there for JavaScript, the library is there for JavaScript, but it's actually a C++ code base. But this library is very interesting. There are a couple of reasons why. The first one is that this is a low level library. So the flexibility and the amount of forgiveness you get in a typical library of JavaScript, you don't get here. So if you do something wrong, it just blows up in your face. It just ends the node process, everything, right? So you have to be careful. And the second reason why I find this very interesting is because there is a user manual doc in this library, which is very interesting, right? So if you want to learn a little bit about WebSockets in depth, this document is very good, right? Because it covers a lot of things about performance, about compression, about back pressures and what, what is back pressure and how do you handle it. It covers about a bunch of things, corking, concepts of corking as well. But what I want to discuss today is the compression section down here. Now this section, it seems like a regular section at first, but this is a complete rant, right? This is a rant by the developer who wrote this library probably. And I want to go line by line, one by one, and want to discuss a few important things which come to my mind and want to see what's your take is on this. So first things first, we aren't as careful with the resources as we used to be. Just look at that, how many web developers represent time. It's not an uncommon for a web, web developers to send an entirely textual representation of time as 30 something actual letters inside of a JSON document with an actual textual key. This is just awful. We have had standardized time zone neutral representation of time in binary efficient four byte format representation since 1970s. It's called Unix timestamp. So let's discuss about what he's talking about here. If you open your console, let me just see if I can do that. If you open your console and if you start writing a few things, you're going to realize that date is actually interesting in JavaScript. So if you do new date, you get this text-based representation, which is actually, you know, console is doing this magic. This is actually an object. But if you do something like to ISO string, what you see is the string, right? And the string rightly has 30 or something characters, right? Now, if you put the string back into your constructor itself, you would get back the standard date, right? But what the author is saying that you stupid JavaScript developers, why do you not do something like date.now, which is an actual number, right? And if you're just sending seconds, then you can divide it by thousand and float it down. So this is an actual four byte efficient number, whereas you just go ahead and send 30 something actual letters inside JSON document. <sighs> well, this is true. This is this paragraph is not false. I mean, dates could be represented in a much better format because we have Unix timestamp. It could be just a single number. Now, the reason, I mean, <laughs> before I say anything about this, we actually use strings ourselves. We have we used to use Unix timestamps earlier at CodeDAM for communicating between backend and frontend, but we shifted to strings. There are a couple of reasons for this. The first one is that we use GraphQL, right, on backend right now. And GraphQL has two native data types which it can return int and float now if you want any sort of precision that is milliseconds in the date you cannot use int why because this date dot now which actually includes milliseconds as well that's why i divided by thousand first this includes milliseconds right so this number is actually bigger than what integers can support right so the moment you do start sending date dot now down the wire with graphql you can't you have to use a float data type. Even though this is an integer, you still end up using a float because this is not a, you know, even though JavaScript can represent this number, GraphQL is a general purpose 
thing. So it doesn't allow you to send this number down the line. So first is that. Second is that even if you, I mean, even in the database, if you store it as a, earlier we were using, you know, MongoDB, now we are using Postgres, which natively has a date type, but MongoDB, let's say if you're storing this as a Unix timestamp, which we used to do, if you're storing this as an integer, then the same problem arises again. Precision, and even if let's say you leave the precision out of the window, what happens after 2038 when Unix timestamp actually exceeds in even in seconds exceeds the number of numbers available in 32 bit format. So at that point, you either have to switch to long integer format or float or, you know, just might as well switch to text based format, which is like, you know, an ISO string representation, which is new date dot two ISO string. So of course, performance is something we don't take lightly. What we realized is that our workload right now, I mean, this alone, I'm not saying that this wouldn't help, but this alone wouldn't help that much in increasing or, you know, increasing the performance. I mean, we use Node.js, which clearly is a bad backend. If you talk about performance, we could have much better backend uh, programming language. So we lose half of the fight there itself. Then there is a network component which is like, you know, how much time it's taking from US East one server Lambda to give you response. Then your own computer is there, of course. So it's, it's an optimization, which I 100% agree with, but with, at least in our case, the reason I'm trying to justify is that we used to have, you know, Unix timestamp before we switched deliberately to backends to actual string representation, simply because it just made sense, right? It future proofed us. I mean, even though it's like so many years and Future, but still it future proved us and we don't have to worry about integers because there have been non-zero times when our backend actually did crash because we tried to send a date dot now over a GraphQL call and this GraphQL just crashed it, right? Because it's not an integer. So there's that. Let's move on. This is an example of how we have regressed in our algorithmic thinking. I agree. Today, it is common to use textual representations such as bloated JSON to represent data, even though one of most of the bloat is obvious repetitions and inefficient in nature. But we don't care because we have compression. Well, to add to this, a lot of people don't care because they have compression. They just don't care in general, right? So, I mean, this, this condition could be a little bit more relaxed. People just don't care. As long as it's working, they don't care what sort of data they are representing with JSON, YAML, anything. Even the most bloated source format can be compressed down to a small payload with a few repetitions. However, this comes at a tremendous cost in capital. Compression should be seen as a last resort, a temporary duct tape solution for when you cannot sit down and consider something better. Designing clever, binary, minimally repetitive protocols saves enormous amount of CPU time otherwise lost to compression. Hmm. Okay. This is something I can agree with because if you, again, let's just jump back to console. And if you start looking at JSON, you're going to find that JSON is actually pretty bad. So stringify, you're gonna see that this JSON over here is this, right? It includes two quotes, two double quotes, curly braces, and the actual information, the actual information is just that this there is some key A, which is one, right? This is the only information which is represented in the string of length one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? So technically speaking, one, two, three, and four, four characters out of these seven characters, I would say they are metadata, right? They are important for you to parse JSON properly, but they are not the data itself. If you go by that definition, this format definitely looks bloated, right? Now, there are other ways you can, you know, represent data. YAML is one. So I like YAML because it's cleaner than JSON, but again, YAML comes with the indentation, typical Python indentation like problems. That's a con, but the pro is that this is a valid YAML file, right? So you can see over here, we have nothing, but but a colon and one minimal information can be compressed even further like this. So of course, JSON carries a lot more noise than other formats like YAML, for example, but it is so deeply integrated into our minds as JavaScript developers, because objects in JS are, you know, one to almost like a one to one representation to JSON. So it just feels natural that you just, you know, send the data in JSON instead of other parsers. Plus, all the tools and everything, for example, Chrome Dev Tools, if you're sending down JSON, they would nicely represent it in the Networks tab, right? If you send down YAML, they won't do that. In fact, like, I don't think, I mean, there is a, inside Networks tab, there is even a way to actually read YAML properly, natively, right? So I agree that a lot of things can have less number of characters if you don't use JSON, but overall, the broader ecosystem is also a problem, right? Because I mean, let's be honest, that's whatever is your environment, that is where you would end up doing, right? If you are seeing that 
Chrome DevTools show JSON nicely. You have thousands, ten thousands of video tutorials using JSON as a format. Then it makes sense for you to just pick up that practice. And at some point in later in your career, you would be advanced enough to realize, okay, this could be done better, right? So there are solutions like Seaborg, for example, which helps you take JSON and convert it into a binary format, and you know, vice versa. He also mentions Protobuf as one of the solutions where integral references can be used instead of textual strings is the key if you plan on making something efficient. I haven't used Protobuf personally myself but what i think here it means is that you just have an enum like structure where every key name is actually a number which corresponds to the name of the actual key so of course like if you have a huge key you just have to have a representation of what that number is on back end as well as on front end and you can just debug it properly or you know decode the messages properly so yeah if you plan on using json that has to be compressed you might as well just shove your computer down a shredder and go do something else this is a bold statement some of the best applications in the world have been made by people who would not follow this so i mean you could be a great C++ or C developer who has written this library, but this is just a little bit of more aggression than required. But I mean, I understand this is a rant, so uh, we can let that go. It is true that we can do more per message deflate messages per second than many other solutions can do uncompressed messages per second, looking at you, WS package. And yes, we are entirely stable while doing so, but still, JSON is terrible. <laughs> this guy hates JSON, right? So yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> So you might say, hey, that's too complex. Well, build an SDK for your users then. Strap that complex protocol up in a JavaScript library that internally knows about this palette and exposes only simple to use function for the user. It's not that hard of a problem to solve. Well, that is true. Well, that is actually true. And if you are building a website that transfers hundreds of messages per second and uses JSON as a protocol, which by the way, we also do at CodeDam right now, we use this library. And this is something we are also guilty of. We might as well just use some solution, right? Where it converts JSON, the final JSON before it's sense to wire into something which is a more binary format which is you know less space eating and then you know convert it back into json why not i mean that seems like a good choice to avoid compression if compression is so expensive then at least we can compress it by having a more efficient format right so one level of compression is that you find repeated patterns and then you you know a blind compression which this library has to do like it has to actually use a standard compression thing second one is you just change the format in the first place right which seems a little bit more simpler a little bit more stable and uh, faster of course because you just take the overhead of compression from the library your format itself. So what about TLS and SSL then? I still have to encrypt. Well, he goes on to say that TLS is actually much, much faster, right? than compression in general because modern CPUs have hardware offloads for this. I did not know this personally. Modern CPUs have dedicated or special hardware which can, you know, do this level of computation which TLS requires. So TLS is, of course, if you don't know, it's like the this thing, the HTTPS stuff and WSS, the secure stuff where your server encrypts and decrypts messages before sending. So nobody in the middle can read. They can intercept, but they can't read what it is. Unless, of course, like there is some some sort of quantum computer breakthrough and, you know, people start decrypting your stuff. So nonetheless, interesting article, very interesting library. We use that and there are definitely some takeaways from this rant, which I hope would help some of you build better apps of tomorrow. Do let me know what you think about this. That's all for this video. I'm going to see you in the next one really soon.